Uh, Dr. Booker Hodges is the current assistant commissioner of law enforcement for the Department of Public Safety. And so, as you know, there's a massive organization. His areas of responsibility is if it's law enforcement related, it's under the, his wings. He's the one that shepherds that, guides it, and leads it. And that means he's overseeing over 1,400 employees, a budget of over $200 million. And uh, specifically, though, you might be aware of places like the State Patrol, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and even the Minnesota Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division. From a professional, though, you'll, you'll hear uh, Dr. Hodge's journey uh, through law enforcement, working as a school resource officer, working in patrol, being a narcotics detective, uh, is all, and also being a SWAT member and a watch commander. He made his way up through the ranks, uh, last serving as an acting chief deputy, and then went on to become the chief of police at Prior Lake prior to being uh, appointed as the assistant commissioner. He's overseen training, human resources, professional standards, technology, and uh, but also one of the things, there's a lot of things noteworthy about, about Dr. Hodges, but he's the only active police officer in the history of the NAACP to serve as a branch president. And so do he had a five-year tenure as the president of the NAACP in Minneapolis, and he was responsible for a landmark agreement there to improve the working conditions for employees of color and to diversify the Minneapolis Park Board. And during that time, uh, his time with me at the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office and then uh, subsequently Sheriff Sarir, uh, Booker was responsible for a lot of hiring and in the jail becoming the first minority majority group of people hired there. Uh, it's just really an amazing thing uh, in the state of Minnesota. He also went on, uh, he's had 20 years of experience uh, as an instructor in a variety of topics. He's a certified human resource manager. And you might sound like I'm exhausting everything. There's more to tell. I'm actually skimming the things he's been involved in. Uh, he currently also writes, <laughs> you think, how does he have time? But he's a writer for a place called, it's primar uh, primar primarily uh, the premier place where police officers go for their information. It's called policeone.com and he's on their editorial board as well. But more importantly to us, he grew up in North Minneapolis. He's a Minnesota kid, uh, earned his bachelor's degree and a master's degree, went on to finish his doctorate work, doctoral work at uh, Hamlin University. He has a wonderful wife, Lorinda, two fantastic boys, Booker and Soren. And I think you'd be delighted to sit, with, sit and listen to his presentation today on unconscious bias and lessons learned in the career of law enforcement. I think you'll find it both highly informative and challenging at the same time. So, Booker, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> you never believe your own commercials, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've grown, uh, I've learned not to believe uh, your own commercials. So, uh, first, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being here today. Uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure for me. Um, optimism is something that we need in this world um, and a lot of times growing up and even now everybody will always tell me one of the traits that I'm known for is being an optimist uh, one of the terms that we used to use growing up was fantasizer <laughs> that's kind of what you know we used to talk about amongst uh, ourselves as teenagers and whatnot and I was always the biggest fantasizer because I always believed in in the positive aspects of life and I continue to believe that um, even in today's world, I know there's a lot going on, but I always look at the positive side of it. Um, nothing is ever all bad. I mean, there's a lot that's, that's come out of this. Um, and I know that a lot of people uh, will come out of this better on, on the other side of this. So that, that's the positive aspect. So uh, uh, Mr. Gorman, are you ready for me or do you got something else to say here? Yo, I am just ready. Uh, Booker, you just keep right on going. This would be great. Thank you for being here. All right, so kind of the way that, that I do stuff is uh, more of a discussion uh, piece here than people just sit and listen to me talk. So I'm just going to briefly talk about um, how I came about uh, the dealing with unconscious bias um, training and whatnot. So when I first started teaching, um, I first developed a diversity program because I was a, a camper uh, up in the Boundary Waters. I used to, I was spent seven years uh, working up at a camp um, in the Boundary Waters uh, called Wilderness Canoe Base that was ran by Plymouth Christian Youth Center. Um, and I basically took Boundary Waters trips since I was 12 years old. And one of the things that I found was the uh, outdoors was not um, 
representative of communities of color. And the reason why for me that was important was I knew that as demographics began to shift, I wanted to ensure that we would have um, outdoor recreational opportunities to enjoy for my kids, my great grandkids and whatnot. So I put together originally a diversity program that specifically taught uh, camp counselors and whatnot how to deal with uh, people coming to wilderness who were from different races. But what I started to find very quickly was uh, I really wasn't teaching people what I thought um, they needed to know. And in fact, in many instances, I was just reinforcing stereotypes. So what I mean by that is this, if I teach you how to deal with um, someone from the uh, Somali community, right? So if I teach that, you know, typically uh, discipline is, is left to uh, men in the Somali community uh, as opposed to women, what happens when you come into contact with uh, someone um, from the Somali community who doesn't uh, fit that um, fit in that box, uh, then people would get stuck. So for me, what I what I started to do was really look at this area of how do we get from the point of people's minds taking shortcuts, because as human beings, that's something something that we naturally like to do um, and get to the point to where we can treat people as individuals. Because I firmly believe that is if we can begin to start looking at each other as individuals, uh, we can begin to function as in the society the way that we're intended to, to function. And what I mean by that is this, um, I want us to get away from them and they, right? I think if we start to get away from them and they and move to us and we, uh, we can really start to move in, in society. So what I did was, as part of my dissertation, I really started looking at police officer stress. And what I found was that there was some distinguishing differences between the way officers had uh, perceived stress uh, based on race and the leadership of the organization. And I further started to drill down to that. And that's where I came up with uh, the unconscious bias training piece. And basically what, what that is, and I'm gonna share my screen in a second, you'll get the reader's uh, digest version of this, is that people by and large don't treat people as individuals. We look at, we like to take shortcuts and uh, and and kind of marginalize people, right? Like that's something that in humans we just naturally do. And if you read the Bible, it's kind of uh, indicative, you know, throughout the Bible where you know certain groups of people were just cast in in one group, and we didn't really focus on the individuals. So by developing this program, uh, what I started to realize in law enforcement, especially. Uh, having the dual identity of being an officer of color and um, being a police officer was that the community had often thought that the police department, specifically in the, in the communities of color, that the police department was by and large an organization that practiced racism. And what I found from my own experience was that uh, just like any other organization, if you look at the media, if you look at schools, there, there are people who shouldn't be there. But by and large in law enforcement, the vast majority of people that work in the profession are great people. Um, so we wanted to look at how can we get people to stop um, looking at people as a group and go back again to looking at people as individuals. So. I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to go through uh, the Reader's Digest version of what normally takes us three hours to do. So hopefully uh, I can explain this to you uh, pretty quick. Uh, so yeah, let, let me uh, try to figure this out here. Uh, uh, Terry, did you give me the right to share a screen? Yes, Booker, I did. I made you a co-host. Okay. Um, it's gonna take me a second. I guess I gotta allow some privacy thing to take place here. All right. Oh, hold on. Hopefully this thing doesn't kick me out. Sorry. All right. I think we should have it here. All right. right. Yep. So what we have here is uh, this is a sheet that I typically use when we do training. Um, so first, when we talk about unconscious bias, I want to be clear here, unconscious bias is not a training that focuses on uh, racism, because at the end of the day, there is no amount of training that is going to fix a person who is a true racist. Um, the only thing that you could maybe hope for with someone who is a real practicer of, of racism and really holds those beliefs 
beliefs is a significant life event. So we don't um, focus on racism because that is not what unconscious bias training is. It's not dealing with racism. So first and foremost, uh, I just go to number two, which is uh, all humans, regardless of their race or anything else, have biases. This is just something that is just natural to human beings. Uh, I am from Minnesota, born and raised, and I love the Vikings. I do not like the Packers. <laughs> right? I just, I don't. I'm biased against Green Bay. Um, and that's just, you know, I, I put that in a, in, a, in a comical sense. But when you think about it, uh, as human beings, we, we all do have biases. Uh, and the second point I want to make her here is uh, number three, uh, unconscious, but your unconscious mind can process more information than your conscious mind by using shortcuts. Um, and what I typically do is I would, if you ever seen Sigmund Freud's uh, iceberg of the mind where you got, you know, obviously the, the small part on top and then the bottom part is the bigger part that most people don't see is your unconscious mind is going to make decisions um, a lot faster than your conscious mind. And what the analogy I'll use for that is this, uh, how many people here have ever left work and uh, know, you know, when you left work, you told yourself, I got to go to the grocery store. And then the next thing you know, you end up and you're in your driveway at your house and you're like, ah, oh, I forgot that I had to go to the store, right? A lot of times that's because your unconscious mind is so used to driving home that it's made that decision uh, to the point to where you forget that you have to go to the grocery store because it's something that you're so used to, to doing, right? A signature, right? If, if you look at your signature, I, I bet if you looked at how you sign documents from when you're a kid to now, it's pretty much the same way you don't even think about it, right? So your unconscious mind makes decisions way more uh, than your conscious mind. And the, the thing about it is it does that by making uh, shortcuts. And what I talk to police officers about is if you've ever listened to cop radio or, or watch police shows, uh, when a call is dispatched, the officer wants all the information that he or she could possibly get up front, right? And the reason for that is they want to start making decisions before they get there. Well, a lot of times, and I, I use myself as an example of this in my career where I found out early that doing that can be very bad. Um, you, you, you get this information, your mind's already made up. So I'll use me as an example. Uh, earlier in my career, I got dispatched to a domestic call. And based on the information in the call, I had already made the decision that the guy was going to jail before I even got there based on the information that, 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 that I received. Well, after getting there um, and still stubbornly moving forward with my decision um, and arresting the guy and I get him in the back car and then something backseat of the car and then something just hit me like, oh, man, he's telling the truth. <laughs> right? And my mind had already my mind had already been made up that that I was going to arrest him because I took a shortcut. And that is something that's really indicative of human beings for us to do is, is to take shortcuts. So what I encourage people to do in law enforcement and what I found to be beneficial is just to slow down and not take shortcuts. Another term for shortcuts is stereotypes. And a lot of times we like to stereotype people. You know, if you look at how do we refer to uh, communities of color, like black, or white, Asian, Latino, right? And we like to put these groups in boxes. Well, the problem with that is a lot of people within these groups might not fit that box. Right. So if we can get to the point to where we actually deal with an individual, if people look and assume that, you know, I'm black, you know, I used to run the NAACP, people would automatically put me in a box and kind of assume that they know kind of how I lean in one way or another. And in an actual reality, they could be wrong. So it's just this whole notion of treating people uh, basically uh, uh, on an individual basis. And number four, and this is the uh, the key one here that I normally focus on a lot. And I think for you all, and I think this the difference too between an optimist and someone who's a pessimist is our unconscious mind makes decisions based on our background and our experience, right? Your back, all your unconscious mind is going to make decisions on your background and your experience. And if you think about police officers, when police officers train and we fight. You know, you do use of force stuff. It's all done in a repetitive motion. And the reason for that is, is if you get into a confrontation or something happens, that automatically comes and you automatically have to, you, you know, your unconscious mind kicks in and you're doing stuff without even think about it, right? So your background and your experience are your the main determining factors of 
uh, what's going to uh, change your um, or going to your background experience are the main determining factors regarding how you're going to make decisions. And the way I, I always use it with my kids is this is my kids, um, one of them doesn't like pork chops, right? I don't particularly care for pork chops either, but he doesn't like pork chops. My wife likes pork chops. His background and experience with pork chops is that they're nasty. But the good thing about uh, your background and experiences is they can be changed. So when he gets really, really hungry and the only thing his mom's gonna give him is pork chops, that pork chop's gonna be good, right? <laughs> so what happens is, the good thing is the, you can change your unconscious bias or really work on your bias by changing your experience. That is key. Uh, we are human beings. Everything that's been baked into us is it formulates our background and, and our experience. Um, and there's some other stuff, but I'm gonna come back to that in a second regarding background and experience. Um, number five, we talked about the unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis when making decisions. Those are those knee jerk uh, reactions um, that can come again based on your background and your experience. Uh, the vast majority of our decisions are made by our unconscious mind and not our conscious mind, right? And the analogy I use here for people normally is do you, when you sit in a chair, do you think about it or do you just sit, right? And I, I jokingly say with uh, a lot of the friends uh, who are uh, followers of Christ, I normally say, well, do you put more faith in that chair than you do in the Lord, right? <laughs> so I mean, when you think about people sit in that chair and it's just like, you don't even think about it, right? So your unconscious mind makes more decisions uh, than your conscious mind. Uh, but the other part of that um, is number seven on the sheet here. Um, when we talk about, there's this thing that's called the uh, unconscious danger detector, and it determines whether or not something or someone is safe before uh, we can even begin to consciously make a decision. Now, we go back to your background and your experience are uh, how you, your unconscious mind makes decisions, right? And if you have a negative background or experience with a certain group of people, if you feel threatened, your mind is automatically gonna make those decisions before your conscious mind can even keep up. So when we deal with police officers, what I do here is I really have people do a deep dive personally, right? I mean, like, what are your own biases, right? So I know for me, I've had biases growing up uh, my life. And I, I can tell you uh, with, with certainty that by changing my background and experiences with uh, groups that I may have had a bias against, uh, I've really changed my unconscious mind uh, in my decision-making process. But this danger detector piece is one in which if you do have these biases towards uh, certain groups of people, for law enforcement, that can have deadly consequences. Um, and it's it's something where, you know, what I tell people all the time is this, is if you think about, if you've never dealt with a group of people and then you come to an area and you're dealing with people who are different than you, and you're only dealing with a certain segment of those populations that are different than you, and that popul certain population may be those who are committing crimes, that's gonna formulate your background and experience with that group of people. And to combat that, you have to really get out and deal with people who are different to start changing your background and experience. Um, and number eight here, uh, the only way to change our unconscious uh, bias is to change our background and experience with those who we have biases against, right? And I, I jokingly say in Minnesota, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, the, the interracial dating or interracial marriage was a, a Swede and a Norwegian, right? So, <laughs> And obviously see that that over the years, right, the background and experiences it has changed, right? So we don't, you know, really focus, you know, people don't really focus on, you know, uh, the, the differences between Norwegians and Swedes um, regarding uh, marriages and whatnot. So the only way to really change uh, your unconscious bias is to really focus on uh, changing your background and experience. Um, and number nine is, uh, and I know this is not grammatically correct, but I did write it this way on purpose. Uh, you can change your background experience with those who are different than you by socializing and familiarizing yourself with people who are different than yourself, right? So this, again, goes back to reinforcing, changing your background experience, socializing with people who are different than yourself. And what I challenge people to do for the last nine or for 10 and 11 is I have everybody, and police officers, 
write down who are your friends, right? What's the racial makeup of your friends? And if all your <laughs> friends look like you, uh, we put the calendar ping number 11 is six months out. Have you had a chance to get a friend who is different than you? And I'm very specific here I, how I define friend. I, I jokingly say this is a person that if you called and asked for $100, they might razz you, but they would at least give you <laughs> give you the $100, right? Uh, someone's house who you go over and eat, right? Not just work <clears throat> associations, right? These are like someone house you've been over, they've been over your house, really breaking down uh, those, those barriers. And what I've found in, in my history of teaching this, and I say with every class I teach, the goal is if I can get one person, one, that's all I need, one, to really buy into this and change, uh, to try to change their uh, lifestyle or how they view certain groups of people. Uh, every class I've taught, I've always gotten follow-up from at least one person uh, by his grace that, that people have uh, really said that, you know, I used to think X about a certain group of people, but once I started to hang out with them, um, I realized that that was not the case. And what I've decided and try to do now is to judge people based on an individual basis and not lump people all together in, in groups. And one of the uh, stories that I tell all the time about this was I had, um, there was two cops in Alabama. Uh, one was black, one was white. And uh, the white officer uh, was raised to hate uh, black people. I mean, his, his family had taught him all kinds of stuff about black people and he got a black partner. Um, and they had to ride in the same squad car every day in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, what the white officer, and, and they, they, they're both very candid about, about this. Uh, so the white officer uh, said initially, you know, he would get in the car and he'd bring air freshener because his parents had told him that, you know, people of color smell, smell a specific way or whatnot. And uh, what he said that it, what changed him was he'd watch uh, his partner talked to his wife and his kid. And he said that he noticed that his partner was saying the same stuff to his wife and his kid that the white officer was saying to his wife and his kid. And uh, they ended up uh, hugging and, and crying and, and doing all that. And, and it really changed people's lives. So I think if we get to the points where, you know, we view people as individuals and not as groups, it's, I mean, we can really uh, move forward. So with that, uh, I've been talking long enough. So if people got uh, questions, <laughs> feel free to ask. So I'm going to try to maybe, uh, Booker, if you could uh, take down your um, uh, screen share, I think it will help people help us see the other folks. Uh, so if people, I did put a note in the chat. So if you'd like to uh, raise your hand, that's a good way for us to kind of track who's uh, uh, going. And I see we have one from uh, Lauren Sorensen. So Lauren, if you'd uh, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Thank you. Okay, my question is, are we genetically engineered to have some kind of a bias? Uh, I think to your uh, statement about black versus white, well, I come from Western Minnesota, we didn't have blacks, so we were all whites. Uh, we also could be divided down on Swedish and Norwegian, like you said, but we didn't have the Norwegians either, we were all Swedish. Mm -hmm. But yet we had to find some way to differentiate among ourselves, so we decided the best way was to be the the Lutherans versus the Catholics. <laughs> and so, and this, again, like I said, this is like a three hour class. I normally, I, I dive deep into what you're talking about here. Cause uh, there's a video that was done by some uh, researchers out of Yale. And what they found is, is that human beings innately have the bias to favor the self, right? That is something that we innately have in us is to favor uh, people who are like us. Right. And that's why if you if you look and this is what when I talk to police officers specifically, and you always see this when we train for like active shooter uh, situations. Uh, initially, when people first go through that, it takes a second of training for people to actually run towards uh, the gunfire versus to run away. Right. Because as human beings, we naturally have that bias in us to favor um, the self and people who look like us. And I, I, I jokingly say, if you look at a lunchroom, if you go eat lunch, and I, I say this to cops, um, if I'm in uniform and I walk into a lunchroom with uh, a bunch of people who are not cops and I see one cop sitting there in uniform, uh, even if I don't like that person, 
I'm more likely going to go sit and eat with them than anybody else because we we just have that nature in us to to want to do that, and it's something that we have to try to overcome. Thank you, Booker. Um, I do see that Dave Mayor Dave Bartholomew has his hand raised. Dave, do you have a question? Yep, thank you, thank you, thanks for being here. This is great, Booker. Great. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, Matt Bosterman talked to us earlier about kind of hiring for character you know, and then training beyond that. And so my question is kind of, you talked about when you go out and do trainings or when there is trainings for either existing or new officers, um, is, is it really a group thing or is it really that you're presenting this and trying to find individuals, like you mentioned, that kind of will get it, where like a light bulb pops on, epiphany, they, they kind of all of a sudden realize stuff. I mean, is it is it effective as a group or is it really an individual journey here? So it, it's effective as a group. But it's, it's like most trainings where, you know, individuals in a group are going to receive stuff differently. And by state law in Minnesota, every police officer has to have uh, some type of training in this, in this vein. So it, it does work uh, both in a group and with individuals. I mean, any training you do, you know, you're going to have some people that are just going to come uh, try to check the box. But the vast majority of these people do get it because I, the in-depth training that I do for this, I, I, break down police officer involved shootings um and i get to the point to where i know how cops are because i'm that way too i get to the point to where people can't refute the science right and then once you get to that point you can start to make uh, some progress with them. great thank you thank you i see that kirk i think it's Posell. Possible? wow nobody ever gets that Possell? right thank you <laughs> yeah kirk you had your hand up if you wouldn't mind asking your question you know, the funny thing is, I always used to tell people that my name is like Howard Cosell with a P, but the younger generation goes, what? <laughs> um, and, and that kind of brings into my point here. Is that let's let's even take race out of it. We, uh, as a society, have had so many ways to differentiate each other and kind of group ourselves together, right? It's like we have religion, we have age. I mean, how many times do you hear things about the baby boomers and, and millennials? And, and we've all kind of... Um, compartmentalized all of that stuff, right? And I, I work in the Medicare insurance agency, so I don't believe this is true, right? There's a lot of baby boomers out there that are are, are very open-minded and very uh, open to change and to that kind of things. And there's some that aren't. My question to you, sir, and, and if you would say hi to Mr. Harrington for me, I'd appreciate it. I love There's that guy. The room over there, yeah. Oh, tell him <laughs> hi from me. But But okay, here's the deal. If we have to start at square one, Okay, let's let's clear the slate. There's no more black, white, uh, green, purple, Hispanic. There's no religion. There's no there's no um, generational bias here. What do we need to do in your eyes to start to grow this so we do look at each other as equals and as as people and not people in a different group? What I'd love to hear your answer for that. And thank you for taking my question. You know, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. I mean, really, you know, when you look at kids and kids play, um, something just happens to us when, when life uh, bakes on us. And I, I think, so in the non-humanistic standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm gonna preface with saying that in the non, mm -hmm. we are assuming, <laughs> uh, it would be viewing each other. Crazy as, crazy. Yeah, it, it'd, be like a, it'd be like a oneness, right? Where we view each other um, as one, right? But that that is something that's really hard to do because as humans, again, I go back to it is naturally for us to do us and them, us versus them and then and they. Right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter who them and they uh, typically are sometimes. But we could go back to viewing each other as one, um, as one group, but also expecting or respecting each individual's uh, differences. I, I think that would be the solution but as humans it's really hard to get us not to group up um, so I, I, if I may, can i ask a follow-up to that then because i think you brought up a really brilliant point here is that as children when we're on the playground as children we all play together and there is no we don't see color we don't see religion we don't see age what is it that changes as we grow up. And I mean, I know that life experience takes a lot of that away, but if we could start there and I'm more willing to help with this, by the way, I, I'd love to help with this. Um, how, how do we, how do we get back to that where we can all play together in the same playground? 
And I, you know, and I go back to background and experience, right? I mean, kids, when they're in the playground playing with each other, if you look in areas where those groups stay together, uh, you normally don't see a lot of those stereotypes in it. But what happens, you know, as people, kids start here and then kids go here and there, and then life starts to pile on them. And that, that's kind of how, how stuff unfortunately works. It's just a matter of continuing to expose people to people who are different than them throughout their lives and not reinforcing uh, stereotypes. I mean, I, I was fortunate that I grew up in a household uh, where, you know, my dad didn't say, you know, people X are all like this, right? I mean, my dad would always say, judge a person person by, by their character uh, and really treat people as individuals. He didn't say them and they. Um, and I, again, I was really fortunate, but a lot of my friends weren't. Uh, so sometimes when we talk, people don't understand how I can view the world uh, based on individuals. Because, I mean, especially with a lot of the racial issues going on now, like I, I personally don't believe that all white people are racist. I, I don't. I, I know that's not the truth. Um, and Because my experience is, you know, I deal with people on an individual basis, period. I, I, I just don't hold values like that because based on my life experience and it's really for me if we can really start to get people to associate uh with one another throughout their lives not only in their childhood i think uh, we could really uh, make a dent in this awesome and john i'm not going to even try to pronounce your last name i apologize i i, I made i got kurt so i'm going with that so john i see your <laughs> hand raised our new member if you would please ask your question that would be great yeah thank you uh First of all, thanks, Dr. Hodges, for uh, coming in here. This is great. Um, I, I guess I just have a question on, on, do you have any tips for having this conversation with family or friends or, or kind of getting the conversation rolling and talking about some of this with people who maybe are, are a little more reluctant on this topic and, and don't want to believe that there's improvement that could be made? Yeah, so... Um, uh, what you said there is why I put in, in, in the training where I challenge people. I say, you know, look at your friends, right? Inventory your friends. And if everybody looks like you, why is that, right? And ultimately, um, it's on the individual to want to try to change um, something or at least be open to the fact to, to get to hang out with someone who's different than them. Uh, this is that that's the key to this. I mean, this is one of those things where I say you can't force somebody to to do it because what happens when you force people it's a conscious mind piece and it doesn't get in the unconscious mind and when it's in the conscious mind that's really not how you're going to make uh, sound sound decisions but I, what i've found is is i'm just not afraid to have a conversation with folks right and i, I don't care what, what what they say uh i just i'm not so I, what i would encourage you is just don't be afraid to have a conversation and you know you're not always going to be right you're going to make some mistakes and you know but that's how we learn Thank you. Good question, John. The next question, I'm going to ask Jerry Brennan to unmute, and you can ask your question, Jerry. Sure, thanks. Um, am I unmuted? You yes. are good. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, thank you, Doctor, for being here. Um, interesting conversation about the kids in the playground. Um, how do parents, you know, best prepare kids for the fact that somebody else may think they're different and may say something. Talk about self-image, self-esteem. Classic example, true life story. A woman, now older obviously, but when she was eight or 10, adopted Asian, okay, playing uh, with kids her age on the uh, playground in Edina. And at one point, some young guy, one of the kids stopped her and said, you're different, where are you from? And she just looked him right in the eye and said, well, from Edina, silly. <laughs> and all went on. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, now there, there's a good self-image. Didn't feel hurt, didn't feel whatever. And that didn't just happen naturally. And that, you know, so I can tell you what, you know, what I do for my kids. And I, I remember when it first happened with my oldest, uh, you know, my wife is, is, is black. Uh, my two boys are black. And uh, when my oldest um, came back, he was five and a half years old from the playground. And he just said, dad, why does somebody have different skin than me? 
right? And my response to that was, you know, your skin is beautiful brown and other people have different skin and that's just the way God made us to be. And there's nothing wrong with your skin. There's nothing wrong with their skin. Um, and the Lord views us. He doesn't view our skin. He views what's, what's in the heart. And that's, you know, what I've taught my kids and it's uh, permeated with them both. Uh, so when they come home and someone's done them wrong, and I know if they were there, they'd be laughing that I'm telling this story and my wife laughs too. They say, you know, dad, somebody had a bad heart today. They don't say, you know, the one. The one they say someone had a bad heart today. So I always yeah. laugh at that. <laughs> somebody had a bad heart today. Somebody did them wrong. That's great. <laughs> great example, Dr. Hodges. Appreciate that. I do see that Douglas Root, you have your hand up for a question. Yes, I have a question. Um, it, it seems to me Let's that see a lot where of you put your hand up. We got a. Whoop. Hello. We got. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it seems to me that um, a lot of folks of my age, say of optimist age, because a lot of folks of the age of the average member of our club were, were raised or went to schools that were highly segregated uh, in western Minnesota or in suburban Minneapolis. Um, so our life experience uh, didn't include seeing people of other races, people who are different from us as the same, as individuals. And, and I think that has changed to some extent with school desegregation and with societal desegregation. And so I'm wondering if that's a reason for hope for the future. Will uh, the old racists uh, fade as we go through a generational change? Um, I hope so. And here's, um, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. What, what I don't and this the Optimist Club, so I'm going to be careful how I kind of <laughs> word some of this, is I, I think that uh, we have to be accepting of, of other people's views, right? And we just can't tell people who we disagree with that they, they don't have a place at the table and, we, they, and they can't talk, right? So I think, you know, if we get to the point to where uh, we can be accepting of other people's views and really come together, I think, I think we can really make some, uh, headway to that in terms of a society, because it's not just, it, we have to become more accepting uh, in general as a society. And I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, I just I, I just would like us to see us to go more from that, uh, you know, them and they to us and we and looking at people more on an individual basis. And I think sometimes our social media aspects don't allow us to really connect uh, with individuals uh, so that that's the non-optimistic part, but that will be the only non-optimistic thing I will say today. But I, I do think that uh, I, I am hopeful, though, because I, I think that uh, we're, we're starting to hit a turning point with some of these uh, platforms. If I could continue just a bit, I mean, you, you don't mean that we need to be accepting of criminal behavior or, no. or hateful uh, ideas or thoughts. Mm -hmm. No. No, not at all. What, what I'm what I'm saying is, is I think that as a society, we need to. So I'll give you an example, right? Um, say someone who grew up in a um, in a, in a homogeneous um, society, right? And that's just their lifestyle, right? And we bring people together to to meet with people who are different than them, right? There is going to be a, a certain level of knowledge that these people don't have, and they may. Um, want to ask questions right and i think when they ask the questions sometimes the way the questions get asked uh, might appear offensive to to the other other folks right and i think we have to get a, get to the point to where the other folks uh learn how to correct the people asking the questions without totally uh getting people defensive and moving to uh back to those uh us versus them corners if that makes sense it does, Dr. Hodges, thank you so much. Our December speaker, Karen Sullivan, uh, author Bitter or Better has a question. So Karen, if you could unmute yourself and ask the question of Dr. Hodges. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanna say, you know, thank you for your comments. And I, I love the um, discussion about talking about people's individuals versus groups, because I think that the whole segmenting of people into different groups in society is one of the most divisive and troubling things that's happened. Um, I have a 29-year-old son um, who has autism, and 
uh, when he was diagnosed, I started writing in you know the early 2000s about um, awareness and acceptance. And um, some of that was premised upon experiences that we had. And it's interesting, the playground analogy keeps coming up because I remember very clearly when he was in elementary school, it was not a big deal. But as soon as he got to middle school, kids were aware of the differences and uh, would start um, shunning him. And that's when things really got to be dicey. Um, and so things have improved a lot. Um, and I know there are a number of people in this organization who um, are in the disability arena who may uh, share some of my experience here. But uh, now that I'm a grandmother and I have little people who are um, not so clear about you know, what's going on with my son who now lives with us, um, I'm having conversations with, you know, these five and six year olds just explaining, you know, his, his brain works a little bit differently. And, and, you know, sometimes people need help. Like if someone's in a wheelchair, they need a little bit of help to navigate things. And I can see the light coming on. And so I think that one of the most important things that we can do is um, start speaking, you know, to kids when they're young to just put things in context, because we do naturally gravitate towards people who are like us. That's just the way that we're wired. Um, but it is a big world. And to, you know, be more open and accepting uh, of people who are different in all sorts of different ways, uh, I think that understanding um, and having some kind of um, perspective uh, is really vital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that. Um, and that that's one of the things, like I said, I, I still go back to, you know, even when we talk about the, the disability population is I still, you know, when I train cops, I say you still treat every person as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, don't assume that, you know, if someone has autism, that they're going to check these boxes, right? Or if someone's in a wheelchair, that they're going to check these boxes. Deal with that person as an individual. And if you to me, it's a character piece too here. And I know, you know, I'm really not getting into that today, but the character piece of this is when you treat people as an individual, you are respecting them as an individual, not lumping them into a group. Word, that's a great, great example. Um, I, we have two questions. We're gonna start with Roger, your question, and then we'll ask Martin. Um, to ask his question and we'll see if we have time for any more but for sure roger and martin you will um, be able to ask your question so roger please take it away uh, unmute roger My, roger you have to unmute unmute there right. i'm unmuted booker outstanding job thank you so very much i i, I do want to go back uh, and because i could tell from comments that you made that this is right down your line that Kirk uh, Possell, the answer to your question uh, is, uh, you know, we've got to have a, a, a sincere, heavy, early focus on uh, the golden rule. Because when this comes right down to it, as much as people will push aside, uh, and as a former school superintendent, I'm not saying we're gonna make our public schools all private schools, are all religiously private schools, but there's no reason in the world uh, why we should not get to the issue of saying, look, the, the, the whole of, of the issue of relations, whether they're gender or, uh, or religious or race or ethnicity relations, is that we have to start treat, uh, uh, treating people like we want to be treated. And, you know, we're, we're, we're too much into in my estimation, uh, making excuses. And I, I really applaud the approach that you're taking, Booker, because I think uh, one of the things about which we must be very careful is uh, th th these clearly are very sensitive issues that need to be addressed with people listening to each other. And the more that we get into chest thumping, and, and I'm not saying you are, mm -hmm. your approach is beautiful, uh, and uh, accusatory kinds of things, the more we're going to separate people. And, and at, at my age, like a lot of the people in our group, the, the biggest concern that I have at 77 is that we don't need to be, we need to draw people closer and closer and closer together. Uh, and, and, and it needs to go directly at the heart of treating other people like we want to be treated, like we expect to be treated, like our Lord and Savior uh, expected us to treat one another. 
That's my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, you have a question. If you would unmute yourself and ask your question of Dr. Booker, that would be great. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, this is very timely because in my last COVID year, I've become very uh, self-aware of how I interact with people. And what I've learned is that um, I agree with everything you said is all your past will, will lead you to how you have that initial reaction, how you make that initial judgment. And so right now I'm practicing an exercise of pausing before I react. Okay. Take that, take that five second breath. And um, what you try to do there is say, okay, my initial interaction in this engagement that I'm going to have will set the stage where it will give a chance to that person on the other side to take the highest road they can in, 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 in that, re, in us having that interaction. Uh, it starts with how you talk to somebody on the phone. Um, right now, call centers are overwhelmed. And when you have to call, you may have just waited online for 15 in, in a queue for 15, 20, 30 minutes before someone answers. And your initial reaction could be to scream, like, you know, but what I try to do then is thank them for being there. And I try to recognize what they might be going through that day. Um, and then I try to say, let's work through this together. And hopefully you can walk in the house that after that night and either say to your dog, your cat, your fish, your wife, your husband, your child, that you made somebody's day better today. And then we talk about whatever it is. And if they can fix it, we fix it. Do you have any um, other ways that you, you could recommend or you might recommend to the, that you do with the police officers um, that you train on how to, how to stop that initial rush to judgment, how to start the, re the interaction? And that's uh, the whole thing about that I talked about uh, in the beginning, which was uh, our unconscious mind likes to make the decisions based on instinct and not analysis. Um, and, and that's the whole piece about slowing down, right? And, and so when you talk about the phases of how your mind works initially, uh, before you can change your background and experience, it's gonna be about that slowing it down and make sure you're not making those uh, knee jerk reactions uh, to something. And, and that's key. And I think um, with the laws that have recently been passed regarding uh, youth force here in Minnesota, that is something that the legislature has been very clear that they want uh, police officers to do regarding uh, use of force situations is to take that step back um, and really evaluate the situation uh, when practical um, and not make those you know, decisions. And that's you know something that um, we're going to work on to continue to train cops. Um, it's something that it's a paradigm shift in law enforcement. Uh, but I am confident, I think, you know, four or five years down the line from now, uh, we should probably be where we need to be at. Right now. I thank you. And I have one last comment. I worked, I put myself through college working for a moving and storage company. Mm -hmm. So I would pull up in front of houses that were, that would make houses in a diner look like, oh my God, how could you live there? Right. And my point is, once I sometimes, you wouldn't believe how many times you got inside the house and you said, I can't believe how they're living. Right. Mm -hmm. I tell everybody about dishes piled up with maggots and pizza boxes that are 10 days old and kids still trying to eat out of it. My point is a lot of times in your reaction, you don't know what's behind that door. You don't know what somebody's just went through, right? Uh, it could be a challenging teenager. It could be a husband or wife in a tough situation. It could be so many things. It could be right now, loss of employment or income. So even in the, the beginning, your initial rush, now even I think the pause is going to have to be more because yeah. you want to understand that you don't know, yeah. okay? And that's key. All right, thank you, Dr. Brooker. We, our last question will come from Kyle Bartholomew. Kyle, if you would unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm uh, really excited to be here and answering this question or asking a question as well right after Martin, um, because I actually recently graduated from college and worked at a call center for investments uh, at US Bank. And I can tell you, um, yesterday, just alone, we missed over like 200 and some calls because we had, you know, thousands and thousands of people calling in. 
only have, you know, 25 or 30 people that are usually taking calls. So um, it's great to hear that people are looking at it and saying, hey, I'm going to thank them or understand if they are on hold uh, for some time. But my question uh, is more around, you know, is there any way that you found to kind of stop that bias? Um, and I kind of can, I guess, give you an example here. I was in college. I went, I took a, one of probably my favorite class was actually a film studies class where all we did was watch movies and then talk about what we thought about them. I mean, that's the best class you could take in college, basically, no matter who you are. So the main thing people would do is they'd say they always would want to group that movie in a certain genre. Is it a Western? Is it a comedy? Is it a thriller? Is it an action? And they'd always say that you can't really have multiple genres because we have that unconscious bias and want to group things to make it easier. So I know it, it, you're absolutely right. It happens all over in everything. Um, have you found anything particular for yourself that you've been able to, other than just stepping back and taking a second to think about it, um, to kind of make sure that you're thinking consciously instead of doing that unconscious um, bias if it's not the right um, thing that you have set? So for me uh, personally, it is slowing down, but you know I've been doing this for a while. So I, I can tell you like kind of the progression I went to uh, was first slowing down, right? I mean, you know, like, why do I think this? I mean, that's what I'd ask myself right off the bat. Why am I thinking this, right? And normally that would be enough to stop to say, let me look at this individual situation for what this specific person or situation is, right? But now I'm to the point to where, and th again, it, it's taken years. I mean, for me, it's been about five or six years. But now I'm to the point to where I deal with everybody, every situation is individualistic. Uh, I don't look at, you know, background information and people think I'm crazy for that uh, you know i'll give you an example like when we deal with a lot of our uh, east african community right and people always ask you know why why don't you study up on the imams or, or whatnot and i said well why you know when i meet the imam i'll meet the imam and he and i will have a discussion and my views or whatever that come out of this will be based on my interaction with him not some predetermined sheet that you've given me um about what an imam is supposed to be Right. So, I mean, that that's for me, that's that's what that's how I've gotten where I've gotten that today is. But initially for folks, if you're looking to really do it, take that paw and then slowly you'll start to get to a point to where you judge people um, on an individual basis. And for those of you who who have had kids, um, I think that kids are a great place to start to practice. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we all we all got different. Our kids got different personalities and you automatically know. In your mind, you've already made a decision. If you hear something, you already know which kid it is that did it. You know, if the school calls you about your kids, you know if they're telling the truth or not because you know, you know something that your kid will be capable of. But what I even with my kids, even though I know their personalities, I take each individual situation for what it is for that. And, and that's how I, I, I move forward with them. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hodges Booker, this was wonderful. I really appreciate uh, you coming and visiting with us today and talking. I, uh, I, I think about the Optimus Creed and, uh, and the tenets of the Optimus Creed, and boy, you touched so many of them, the promise to be so strong, to make all your friends feel them, to be, take a look at the sunny side of everything. Uh, must forget the mistakes of the past. I think you have to learn from the mistakes of the past to wear a cheerful countenance. And I'm going to, we'll get you a copy of this that you can have for, for yourself uh, on your desk or on your wall there. We really appreciate you being here today and thank you so much. Uh, and uh, again, I'd like to give you a big round of applause and we thank you for being here today. We really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed myself. <laughs>